Lake Erie Nutrients, the binational watershed approaches. Restaurants were closed. There was a lot of activities that happened, a lot of economic, negative economic impacts. Um, it, it just went on, and we had a lot of people. Uh, the governor of Ohio was there, and he was helping. And then a couple days after, when finally on Monday morning, when we returned to being able to drink the water until we could, and then they told us that um, they started at what I call blame game. Ohio started bringing out information about the age of the Toledo water plant, which is really awful, that needs to be fixed. But the real problem was the microsystem in Lake Erie. And then they started throwing money at us, money that $150 million from the state of Ohio. It turns out that was all just reallocated money, lower interest, but it wasn't new money. So our fear is that this huge event will not, in fact, change what's happening in Lake Erie. And then the community after Lake Erie, after this effect, was that moms couldn't, um, most mothers in our area are using bottled water for their formulas and that sort of thing. It's broken the confidence of the tap water that most of us always said, don't drink bottled water, drink tap water. Um, but now, because of the microsystem issue, it's become a problem. So we have like 10 recommendations that we think would help, the biggest of which is more of a federal oversight of the lake, a federal plan, accountability. What we keep day after day, what's been happening since this event, is the senators come in and the state comes in and they say we're giving $2 million, mostly, most of it's to the agricultural community, to the farmers for winter crops. I mean, all good projects, but they're not necessarily being targeted, we think, where they'll give us the greatest return. We want a big plan that says how that fits into the big picture. We want an executive order from the president that coordinates the federal agencies. And we want better management of manure, which in Ohio is a real uh, red herring. They, we have, we want a ban on frozen ground. We want the agronomic rates of application to be similar to that of what fertilizer uses. Right now it's 150. It would be down to 40 is what the ag rate is. And we would um, really like to see also source water protection programs for the water intakes. And the other kinds of outliers that are part of the, the, the question is the Detroit River internal load in the lake. And again, manure, we're just not understanding exactly how they play into the whole picture. So we're hoping the Toledo situation, and you're being here, and what the, the momentum that it gains will actually be a turning point for Lake Erie and have a good plan, an accountability plan, an annual report card, what's being reduced and how we're gaining ground rather than losing it so we don't have to constantly be threatened with a don't, do not drink ban. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for taking time so I don't have to use my phone. But I want to start off by saying that this problem is solvable. We've solved it in the past, in the 60s and 70s, and we can solve it again, and it's going to take all of us to do so. But I was asked to talk about the political will. And I um, thought by starting with uh, what are the attitudes and needs and desires in Ohio? And last, well, actually, earlier this year, the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition and the Ohio Environmental Council purchased us a polling question. We asked Ohioans, do you support stronger regulations? Two thirds of them on farms, two thirds of them said yes. And it didn't matter if they were Republican, Democrat, or independent. More than 51% across all political um, uh, boundaries said yes. So where is the political will in Ohio? Well, we heard a little bit from CND. We heard that they were trying to change the discussion from farm um, runoff pollution to sorry, to, uh, um, to one of the, the drinking water facility. And yeah, there are problems there, but you don't cure the symptom to treat the problem. You really need to cure the problem. We heard about the 154 million that the state allocated. 150 of that was already allocated for wastewater infrastructure. And um, it's great that they made a, a low interest loan to a no interest loan, but only 1.25 million went to farmers to put cover crops on their fields or to manage water coming out of drain tiles. And honestly, that, um, the money that they're giving to the farmers for cover crops is just for one year, fully funded. So it's really a big waste of our taxpayer dollars to solve this problem, and we don't know if they're, they are really targeted. And at the state level, I should also say at the local level, they are, um, the, the city of Toledo just recently requested some funds for, uh, to do a source water protection plan. But um, 
So what is happening at the federal level, really, or let me back up, I'm sorry. So at the state level, we're also seeing some Democrats call for a distressed watershed um, rule on the Maumee River. And in Ohio, we have a distressed watershed rule. Basically, what that means is that all farmers will need to implement nutrient management plans and take soil samples, which would be really great and a step forward. Um, we also have a Democrat that is uh, calling for a ban on manure of frozen and snow-covered ground. The likelihood of that moving is pretty slim. He is a Democrat and he is pretty new to the General Assembly, so it's very unfortunate. Um, but at the federal level, we are seeing uh, an influx of funding. We've seen about roughly $16 million going towards um, farmers to put on best man to utilize best management practices on their farm fields. And while more needs to be done at the federal level, and this is all really appropriate, the real opportunities lie at the state and the provincial level. And we'll hear from Tony in a minute. But as Lyman said, we really need the governors and the premiers to commit, commit to um, limits on nutrients flowing into our waterways, commit to developing a plan, and commit to actually implementing that plan. And the Ohio Phosphorus Task Force um, in actually recommended some limits, and the International Joint Commission also has recommended some similar limits, and we'll hear from Tinka here soon what's going on at the binational level. But these are all recommendations, and they're not mandatory. We really need our governors and our premiers to stand up and say, we will commit to these limits, and we will commit to actually reducing these nutrients that are flowing into our waterways. So I think that was it for me. I actually ended a little early. All right, I just need to do a, a little switch here. Are these on the desktop, Lyman? Uh, they're in a oh, there we go. Got it. I'm good. I've got it. Where's the thingy to make this? Up on top of the slideshow. slideshow. <laughs> Show me where? On the top, very top. Oh, yeah, yeah. From beginning. All right. Great. Um, uh, it's amazing to be here. Um, my name is Tony Moss. I come uh, from Ontario. I live in a place called Kitchener, which uh, through which the or another Grand River flows. So it's uh, I feel a little bit at home thinking about the water that's flowing uh, next door is, is similarly named. Um, I uh, spent um, much of the last six years of my life uh, directing the National Freshwater Program for WWF Canada. Uh, I left that position about a year ago and have been working as a consultant, just to give you some perspective on who I am. Uh, the work that I've done on algae issues uh, in Lake Erie to date has uh, largely been through a relationship I've had with Freshwater Future. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to a report that uh, we released with uh, Environmental Defense with my friend and colleague Nancy Gaucher, who's here with us. Um, and that's going to kind of be the bulk of, of what I'll speak to in my uh, short five minutes. So a Canadian perspective on algal blooms in Lake Erie is what I'm going to talk about. So um, first, let me just give you a little bit of that perspective before I explain what we've said in the uh, in the report. Um, I think it you know it it's, would be fairly easy, could be fairly easy for Canadians, Canadian jurisdictions, to kind of gaze across the border um, and think about the terrible things that uh, happened in Toledo, but the impacts uh, are not limited to uh, Toledo. So just yesterday. Um, the ban on drinking water in Pelee Island, um, swimming on the beaches around Pelee Island, and uh, eating fish from caught in the area around Pelee Island was lifted. And that was about two weeks, we figured, I think, in our, in our chatter this morning, that that ban was in place. So this is just the recent, uh, most recent, I believe, um, algal bloom bulletin from NOAA. And I put this up here because we see that the bloom has moved east along the Canadian coast. Um, and Pelee Island is, of course, right around here. Um, so th the impacts, while it's not 400, 500,000 people, uh, are similar. Uh, an inability to drink the water, swim in the water, and, uh, and fish from the water. So that's been lifted. 
So the point there being that the impacts um, do uh, come to bear in Canada as well as the U.S. Then there's the other side of the coin. We're not, uh, we are also contributing to the problem in Canada. And again, I think it would be easy to say the Mami, uh, the Sandusky, that's where the bulk of the nutrients are coming from, the phosphorus is coming from that's causing this problem. Um, that's accurate, I think, if you look at the studies that have been done. The challenge that we have as Canadians to stand up and say that is we don't really have a sense what we're contributing. Um, we have very, very little information. The IJC was able to compile very little ma uh, information from Ontario agencies, from Canadian agency agencies, on uh, where the phosphorus was coming from and when in particular. Uh, Monitoring is only done during summer months, not, uh, not during winter months, so we don't have a good sense of the annual total load. So that's a huge gap. Um, and then until um, very recently, I would say, the, uh, the issue really hasn't been on the political radar or on the public agenda. So that's in part why um, Nancy and I got scheming to write a report um, called Clean Not Green. It's framed largely around, uh, sorry, it's framed around algal bloom, blooms in the Great Lakes more broadly, but really the big story is, is Lake Erie. Um, we um, boiled things down to four points in our, in our recommendations, our recommended plan. Uh, keep in mind that the report, and I think Nancy has a few copies, but it's online at freshwaterfuture.org, freshwaterfuturecanada.org, I think, and, uh, and environmentaldefense.ca. Okay. So you can get it online. Um, let me quickly run through the uh, four-point plan. So what we're proposing, and keep in mind that this is targeted at Canadian jurisdictions. Uh, we were focused on our federal and provincial governments. So harnessing market forces to help farmers reduce nutrient runoff. We've got... Um, some pretty great programs out on the land in Ontario um, working with farmers to reduce nutrient inputs. We need to figure out how to scale those up and uh, there's not a lot of money to do that. So what we're suggesting are things like um, embedding pollution taxes, figuring out how to get users to pay um, for the pollution that they generate. And, and where and how that plays out we weren't very specific on because I think more work needs to be done there. Um, Build water smart cities, cultivate uh, water smart citizens. So on the city side, we have uh, a number of large cities around the Great Lakes that still have combined sewer overflows, meaning when there's a big storm, which are increasingly frequent, we get big blasts of uh, largely untreated sewage uh, getting into the lakes. Um, improve our scientific understanding. I gave you a little sense of the lack of information that we have. Um, we know very little, uh, as I said, um, and we really need to beef that up uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to understand the nature of the problem, but when we get to implementation of solutions, are they having an impact? Um, and then we need to create a policy framework that drives action. Um, the Canada-Ontario Agreement, which is the agreement between the Government of Canada and the Government of Ontario, uh, to implement under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is hung up, needs to be signed. Um, we need that to happen. The Great Lakes Protection Act, um, hopefully we'll move through our provincial legislature. Um, but the key point, and I just want to reiterate what Christy said is, um, that's all fine and good. We need to implement this stuff, and that means dollars and people to do it. So that's the four-point plan. I just want to um, end with one more little slide, if I could. Sorry. There we go. Um, Christy mentioned the fact that we all need to get together and work on this together, and I couldn't agree more. And part of the reason why I'm here is so that uh, I can get up in the morning and look that guy in the eye uh, and say that we can continue to go to Long Point on Lake Erie and swim in that beautiful beach. Thank you. Okay, I just need to find mine. Mine on here? Is it in that folder, Tinka? Um, nothing that looks like what I entitled it, so. Uh -oh. Lyman, do you know where it went? Is it Walshaw? Is that mine? Yeah, No. There we go. Perfect. Uh, what's up? Okay, great. Thanks.
Oh, good morning. Um, I am going to provide a brief overview of uh, the binational efforts that we're doing to manage nutrient inputs in the Great Lakes. Um, I am uh, working with my Canadian counterparts um, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, specifically on Annex 4, which is the nutrient annex. Um, there are several commitments that we have to address um, nutrients under the annex which apply to actually all of the Great Lakes. Um, the lake ecosystem objectives are listed there, maintaining a healthy nearshore um, and offshore algal community, reducing the extent of the hypoxic zone, um, addressing cyanobacteria toxins so that they don't pose a human health risk, and maintaining an appropriate tox uh, trophic status of the lake. We also are uh, tasked with establishing phosphorus objectives loading targets and allocations for each lake. There are several commit, um, in addition we have uh, a, a set of time bounded commitments that are very specific to Lake Erie. So that is the focus for us at the moment. Um, starting with Lake Erie by 2016, we actually have to determine phosphorus concentration objectives and loading targets for both the open waters and near shore. Um, determine loading allocations by country and identifying priority watersheds uh, to, to um, develop load reductions. And then starting uh, with Lake Erie again by 2018, we have to actually have assessed the programs to achieve uh, the objectives and to develop domestic action plans and strategies to control the nutrients. Um, this approach, we hope, is going to serve as a framework for the, the remaining Great Lakes that we're going to be working on. Um, there are a couple of other commitments, implementing programs to manage excess phosphorus from both point and non-point sources, and that is an ongoing activity both in the U.S. and Canada um, throughout the variety of programs that we have, both in the environmental agencies, agricultural agencies. Um, Identifying priority watersheds uh, to uh, figure out where we need to focus our efforts. I know a lot of folks have already uh, identified the need to be much more strategic in our efforts and developing phosphorus reduction strategies that will inform the domestic action plans. Just a little bit about our structure. Uh, we have three tasks. Okay. Technical difficulties. Why is that doing that? Next. Okay, we'll just do that. Okay. No. Hmm. Come on. Try this. There we go. Um, we have three task groups. Um, one is working on the science, working on the science related to harmful algal blooms in the western basin, hypoxia in the central basin, and cladophora in the eastern basin. We also have two uh, groups working on evaluating existing programs for both the urban and rural municipal sources as well as agricultural sources. Uh, as the objectives and targets task team complete their work, the source teams are real, uh, actually uh, assessing the effectiveness of our current programs in order to identify opportunities to fill gaps, to innovate or optimize existing nutrient reduction efforts, and they're also trying to get a better handle on how to estimate the loads um, from both the point and non-point sources. Key decisions and outcomes we've made so far Recognizing the urgency of our task, we plan to rely on existing science and models and expect to develop draft phosphorus reductions, um, loading targets for the western basin for harmful algal blooms and the central basin for hypoxia by the end of this year. Our goal is to seek public input and peer review throughout 2015 in order to meet our deadline of establishing these objectives by February of 2016. We plan to apply adaptive management principles, recognizing that this is a dynamic environment and we're going to have to make sure that um, the models we're using and the data we have is keeping up with what's actually going on in the lake and make adjustments if necessary. 
a couple challenges and gaps that we've already identified. Science and research is undergoing um, in, a, in several areas. Aquatic invasive species are a particular challenge for us, particularly the mussels and the impact they've had on the ecosystem, as well as our current understanding of Cladophora is rather limited. Um, the relationship to phosphorus loading is not very well understood, and it's difficult to monitor in the near shore. But both of these issues we think are really important for us to, to work through now because they'll have an impact on the other lakes as well. Um, for our task groups, we're focused on developing inventories and baseline program information this year in 2014, and we're hoping to wrap that up in early of 2015. Defining metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of these programs and identifying opportunities to, to optimize them. Some of the challenges, and folks have already identified these as well, is estimating the contributions from non-point source, sources, both from stormwater and from agriculture. One of the uh, things we're hoping to do is evaluate some of the existing tools and models that we have to see if we can use those in a more effective way to, to improve our understanding. I want to focus a little bit on some of the ongoing efforts that, that we have, uh, just to make sure folks are aware. This is an effort that um, our programs in the U.S. and Canada are, are continuing to address. Um, and I think we're making some progress, although not enough, obviously. Regarding point sources, um, efforts are underway both in the U.S. and Canada to optimize wastewater treatment plants as permit limits um, are um, a, a either put in permits or reduced in permits um, to reduce the amount of phosphorus discharges from wastewater treatment plants. And in Region 5, we work to get um, most of our uh, communities um, to implement long-term control plans for their uh, combined sewer overflows. In addition, the use of TMDLs, uh, Total Maximum Daily Loads, which is a U.S.-only program, I want to emphasize that, that's a U.S. construct, as well as watershed plans, which are both used in the United States and Canada, continue to identify work that is needed in critical watersheds. And I just want to highlight on this map, um, the purple areas are, area, are watersheds in Ohio that already have uh, total maximum daily loads established. The yellow areas up in the uh, upper corner um, are uh, in process, and um, the little purple lines and the purple dots in, in Michigan and Indiana represent TMDLs that have already been established there as well. The difference between Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana is that Ohio has chosen to list their waters as impaired on a watershed basis, so that's why it shows up as a basin. Um, and one last point, the St. Joe watershed is a tri-state effort between Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio to address um, loads in that area. Ongoing implementation of these plans through in implementation of best management practices reduces point source nutrient loads, and many of these efforts are funded by state and federal programs such as our 319 non-point source program, our state revolving funds, and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, as well as several Department of Agriculture uh, programs. Canada also offers cost-sharing programs for municipal wastewater um, projects and agricultural stewardship programs. And I think we're making um, some progress in, in creative, innovative ideas as well. For example, in Michigan, they put a ban on residential fertilizers, and Canada reports that some of their municip municipalities have also instituted similar bans, and they've seen um, some good results from that. Ohio has created a fertilizer licensing program, and in Indiana, they're promoting conservation cropping systems as a way to enhance soil health, which helps retain soil moisture and keep nutrients on the fields. In particular, in Indiana, and I'm really excited about some of the work they're doing in working with the U.S. Geological Survey and local universities and local farmers to actually measure both um, edge of field and in the um, actual waterway the uh, benefits of the work they're doing. Some new efforts that I want to mention as well. Uh, as a result of Toledo, there's been um, a lot of conversation about what are some of the things that are ongoing and what are some things that we need to um, um, 
accomplish uh, sooner. So uh, we're actually developing guidance on harmful algal blooms. We're updating our information um, for water systems on cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins to include more information about sample preservation and handling as well as algal um, toxin treatment information. And we expect to share that um, in the near future. We're also developing health advisories for microcystin LR and cylindro cylindrospermopsin say that twice, um, and we're hoping to release that by uh, in 2015. Um, and that is an effort that we're actually doing in collaboration with Health Canada. And finally, um, microcystin treatment research is ongoing, taking a look at um, samples that are being taken from raw water from uh, Lake Erie, finished water, as well as the treatment train to figure out how to optimize those treatment f um, systems. In addition, as a result of the Toledo incident, the regional administrator in Region 5 pulled together a meeting of key leaders in Michigan, Indiana, and um, Ohio, as well as the USGS, NOAA, um, and NRCS to talk about some of the next steps we have to deal with those issues. As a result of that meeting, the administrator announced uh, on September 3rd um, almost $12 million in GLRI funds that are going to be provided to federal and state agencies to target harmful algal bloom in the Western Basin. Um, some of these efforts are going to be used to expand monitoring and forecast to help drinking water treatment plant operators and beach man managers minimize health impacts associated with uh, HABs, increase incentives for farmers in Western Basin, and improve measurement of phosphorus loads in Lake Erie tributaries. And finally, uh, looking ahead, we're starting to make plans for the development of our phosphorus reduction strategies and domestic action plans. And up there is a list of some of the things that we're considering for those plans. And in closing, I just wanted to give a thanks to the huge collaboration that we have between Canada and U.S. Um, this is a list of several of the entities that are on our subcommittee. We have other folks who are involved in our task groups, and it truly is a binational collaborative effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tinka, and, and uh, everyone on the panel. Um, so now it, it's time to turn it over to you to uh, help uh, ask questions and engage our panel in discussion, um, and also uh, for you to take action. I have here a, a petition uh, that uh, you can all sign. I encourage you to do so. This calls on the governors and, and uh, premiers to uh, call for clear reduction on a, a, a timetable uh, to reduce phosphorus into Lake Erie. And I'll just pass this around. You're free to sign this. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, kick it off with a, uh, we've had a few questions submitted. So I'll kick it off with a question to the panel and then take uh, questions from the audience. Okay, um, <clears throat> I have here a, a, a question from the audience, um, uh, direct to our panel and especially to, to Tinka. Um, so what would it take to speed up the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement timelines to set nutrient targets and implement the action plans. The 2018 for the action plan seems a long way in the future. Um, a couple, I don't know if this is on. They are on. Okay. Um, I, we are limited by um, the need to finish the science. So that's going to be an important piece to what we work on, and that we are hoping to wrap up in the, by the end of this year. I want to make sure folks understand that we are not waiting till 2018 to implement work. There's a lot of work that's already going on. Our plan is to continue to work, to implement work and learn from our experiences over the next several years um, so that we can actually take those uh, lessons and apply them to the domestic action plans that need to go into place by 2018. Um, the domestic action plans, as you might imagine, are a binational effort, but it's also going to include all of the state and local entities as well. Um, so we're going to have to collaborate amongst all those folks and bring that all together. Um, so uh, I think my message is that there's still lots of work going on, and we are trying to coordinate that work in a way that makes the most sense. 
Okay, great. Um, we've we've had several questions. Um, uh, some of them, uh, a, a couple of them here. And I'm going to combine a, a couple of questions here. But um, you know, what uh, what can be done to implement and enforce standards, uh, numerical or or otherwise, to reduce phosphorus? What what if the the main source is agriculture? What best practices? can be implemented or, or requirements put into place? Somebody start. <clears throat> you can start. Okay. Well, every farm is different, and, every, you know, every watershed's different. So, um, you know, certainly we need to adopt some limits. We know that the Ohio Phosphorus Task Force has set some limits. We know the IJC has, and we know that, um, the, through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, they will as well. But um, the scientists know which, uh, which best management practices work best for those particular um, soils, those soil types. And NRCS has a list of recommended um, practices. They are voluntary, but a good start may be to actually require that farms implement a couple you don't have to name which ones, but which ones make sense, that they are required to work with their certified crop advisors and um, the retailers to determine which ones are best for their farms and start to implement them. And that uh, a clear requirement be that they have a nutrient uh, management plan. Can I add to that? Sure. I guess my perspective is that it should be a top-down approach and it should be from the water and the stream as to how much phosphorus is in it and then get back to the farms that can actually do something in that area. There are four million acres in the Maumee watershed alone and it's a very complicated, it's the largest watershed in the Great Lakes. So doing anything, I mean efforts, voluntary efforts in other places in this country have failed and I do not see that size of watershed if we do it that way from the bottom up rather than the top down and that being the waters themselves indicating what the problem is in that particular watershed and then working in the sub watersheds the smaller ones and then working to get those facilities albeit wastewater it's not only ag it's it's wastewater it's stormwater it's fertilizer and it's manure and in many cases in the near shore areas it's also failing septic systems thank you if i may just i'm sorry okay. so um just so we're clear I think we're on the same page. Sure. So we, <laughs> we're saying the same thing. We start with what's going on. We set some limits. We start what's going on in the watershed. We determine what is able to be used on those, on those farms. Because it's not all going to be the same. And yes, the sewage, the sewage treatment plants, the golf courses, everyone has a role to play. Um, and the sewage treatment plants, you know, they have come to the table. They realize, they, they do want to be part of the solution. They realize they have a role to play, and yes, they have more to do. But largely, they're regulated. I mean, they're pretty much really regulated. And we could talk about whether or not that they're meeting those, those particular requirements, um, but a lot of them have come to the table. They want to be part of the solution. But we do need to address the largest problem that is flowing into our waterways. And I'll just counter with that a bit Christina are friends but um, <laughs> we do a lot of this <laughs> we do the Detroit wastewater plants a great example of what happened with you know they had some problems there and the state of Michigan stepped up and has done a huge reduction in just the plant operations mm -hmm. which wouldn't have happened without all of us intervening in that and it's over a hundred thousand pounds per year being a phosphorus being reduced coming into Lake Erie more like 150 and it's through process changes within the plant. It's not even getting down to the last part of it, which is actually phosphorus reduction and the treatment of it. I do not believe wastewater plants throughout the Lake Erie watershed are all doing the same thing and trying to get their numbers down. I don't know that they're even being asked in some cases, and I think that needs to be done. Mm 